Good morning. Certainly thankful that you were all here this morning. It is a blessing every time we have the opportunity to be able to do so, to get together and to be able to worship God. And that is what we're going to be talking about. We're continuing a series on worship, and we are studying about worship. And this is the second portion of our study. And at the outset, I want to make a few additional comments that emphasize that all of life is not worship. And then I would like to look at a different aspect of that worship that we did not cover last time we were together. It's very important for us as we study to look at all of the evidence. When you study a topic, it's important to go and to look at all of those things that are said about that topic and to study it comprehensively. And when we do so, when we study a thing comprehensively, it allows us to have a better understanding of the whole, of the big picture and how all the pieces fit together. You know, if you had a puzzle that had a million pieces, and you were to dump those pieces out and just throw them all over the place and said, now, get busy putting that thing together. However, you had a guide and it showed you the big picture, but you refused to look at it. You refused to look at it ever. You set it aside and you said, you know what, I'm not going to look at that big picture. I'm going to sit over here and I'm going to try to put this thing together piece by piece. Can you imagine the frustration? How, ooh, that would be bad. That's, 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 that's torture, it sounds like to me, to try to do something like that. But that's what happens when we try to look at the Bible without looking at the big picture and to see how it all fits together. We have to look at each piece. Certainly, we must. But we also need to see how they all fit together and then look at that big picture. It's very important for us to do so. So, we have a lot of people today that are claiming that all of life is worship. I have a few quotations for you. Now, on this particular quotation, this claim is that worship is a lifestyle, not an event. Now, a lot of the quotes that you're going to see on this slide, you know what, when you first hear them, <laughs> that sounds good. You know, it's really catchy. And I'm like, oh man, that sounds great. I could put that on a t-shirt. I could wear that. That sounds good. That'll sell. Well, it may sound good, but it may not be biblically sound. It may not actually be scriptural, though it may sound good. It may feel appeasing. And the idea, these are false claims, but these are claims that individuals make. Another says, again, we read that worship is not what we do but who we are and what we are about. It is, or should be, our life. Worship is the day-to-day -day relationship that we have with Christ. Now, what's interesting when you try to get through a lot of this is even in the next quote that we'll look at, there may be certain parts of truth mixed in with something that is not. And that makes it even more challenging to understand that, oh, the whole statement's false because a part of it is. Because it's mixed with some truth. Let's go down and look at the next quote. Here it says, uh, singer and songwriter Michael W. Smith says, of worship, do it unto the Lord and everything you do. Again, that, you know, it's, it, it's true in, in, in the idea that we need to give our all. And so you see some part of it seems to be true, but notice as he continues on, he says, do according to everything that you do under the Lord, your job, your friends, the guy at the quick stop, the guy at the little market you go to, uh, whatever and wherever. It is the way you treat people. All of that is worship to me. Experiencing God's creation. Now, again, in that idea or that statement, there is a mixture of some truth along with false statements. Things that cannot be substantiated and things that are actually false. And so the problem is we have a lot of people that have no biblical knowledge or they're just not studying the Bible and they don't really know what the Bible says regarding worship. And then they'll look at that and they'll say, you know what, that sounds right. That sounds good. And so they believe that when they're going to the quick mart and talking to the guy at the, the, the gas station, they're worshiping God. But that is not what the Bible conveys. It is not the picture that we see of what worship actually is. And that is why it's so important for us today, because this is a movement today. And there are a lot of denominations that are pushing in this direction because we are surrounded by those that are members of these religious groups, and that's what they have been taught to believe. Then we need to know how to give an answer. 
We need to be able to sit down with the Bible, open it up, and provide some answer to those that are being taught that everything that you do, everything, is worship. Because that is not accurate according to the Bible. Notice, and here's a quote from William Stewart, he says, All robins are birds, but not all birds are robins. I'm going to read it slow because you have to really think about it. You have to process what we're saying here. All canoes are boats, but not all boats are canoes. Now, it may sound like, oh, that seems simple. Some may still be mulling it over, but it, these statements seem really simple. But when it comes to worship and service, then somehow we get it all out of whack. Again, all sandals are shoes, but not all shoes are Sandals. Equally, all worship is service to God. But not all service to God is worship. The Bible makes a recognizable distinction between the two. And because of that, then it's really important for us to understand. So when the guy over here in this last quote that we read, and he's talking about going to the quick mart, and he's talking about going out and meeting people and living as Christ would have us to live, you know what that it actually is? He said it was worship, but it's not. It's service. We're serving God by how we live, by glorifying God in the way that we live and exemplify Him in our life, in the way that we act, in the way that we speak, in the things that we do day in and day out. We're serving God. But just simply putting, you know, having an interaction with somebody at the gas station does not mean that I am worshiping God. It's very different. It's very important for us to see this. Now, let me give you an example. Daniel and his friends served King Nebuchadnezzar according to Daniel chapter 1. But they would not worship him and they would not worship his gods. That's important because even in the Old Testament, in this example, you have someone that was willing to serve the king but refused to worship the king. What does that tell you? There's a difference in service and worship. Daniel faithfully served Darius but would not obey a mandate that the king Darius gave, which forbade petitions to anyone but the king. So he was willing to serve him, but when the king said, now you can't petition anybody else but me, now wait a minute, there's somebody higher and that's God. And so when the local government, the king said, you can't worship your God, you must worship me, he was refused to do that. Though he still was serving King Darius. I want you to catch that. He was serving, but he refused to worship him and refused to put anything above his God. He continued to do what? Worship God. So there is a difference between the two. Nebuchadnezzar was not satisfied with their steadfast labor as his subjects. And you know what he wanted? He wanted worship. And in like manner, our diligent service before God is not accepted by him as worship. Let me repeat that. Just our service. If I didn't worship, and all I did was go around serving God, and all I did was have interactions with people at the gas station, at the local mart, and the restaurant, and everything else, and I never actually worked, I just went about my life, then again, that diligent service is not going to be counted as acceptable worship unto God, because it's just service to Him. There is a distinction in the Bible. Beyond our faithful walk as His people, God requires, and He is due, our worship. And so, as a faithful Christian, we must have faithful service to God. But we also, in addition to that service day in and day out, we must worship God in spirit and in truth as He has commanded us. And so that is also very important indeed. Our life of course, is devoted to God. We can see in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13, he says, let's, let's hear the whole conclusion, the conclusion of the whole matter. What is that? To fear God and to keep His commandments. For this is the whole of man, the whole duty of man. So our service to God encompasses fearing God, obeying His commandments, serving Him day in and day out. And as a devoted Christian, a devout Christian, that is exactly what we're going to do and must do. So the nature of our service before the Lord 
actually reaches beyond our worship because worship is encompassed in a smaller area, whereas service is much broader. So when we talk about the nature of our service, it's much, much broader, and it goes beyond the worship assembly. And so that's very important for us to understand. There's a lot of things that regulate our worship, and the Bible teaches that. And on the other hand, there are certain things that regulate just our day-in, day-out life. The Bible commands us to be patient. Does that specifically deal with our worship to God? That's just every day. It would include in our worship service. We ought to be patient then all the time. And so it would encompass during the worship service, but every other day and every other hour, the Bible commands us also to be patient. So it's very important to see the difference. In Romans chapter 12 and As I stated before um, in the lesson that follows this one, we will dig even deeper into a word study and, and, and look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. But I want to look at the contextual meaning of the verse before we dig into the word study of service in this verse in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. And the verse itself, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. The mistranslation that has been placed there is in worship in some translations, and uh, that is a mistranslation. And so this chapter here, the whole of the chapter, it describes our moment-to-moment service before the Lord, not our worship. And that's important. Because what happens is sometimes when people just open up their Bible and they may have a different translation than the King James, and they open it up and they read a verse like this and it says, now this is your worship. Then they're going to say, okay, well then this is the worship. That means all of life and everything that I do is worship. The problem is that word has been mistranslated. If you actually look in its context without doing a word study of the word itself. If you just simply look at the context, context means verses before, verses after, that is the immediate context. So if you look at the verses that surround it, you will clearly see what is being identified here. It's talking about how we serve God on a daily basis. Here, the encouragement that is given is that we are faithful in our daily lives. And so if you look, just as an overview, verse 2, keep yourselves away from the world. Be separated from the world. And as the ecclesia, those that are called out from sin and wickedness and evil to live a different type of life, we've been sanctified, set apart for a holy and sacred purpose then that shows us that we are to be different. We're not just like the world and how they they would live, but we are different. We are living a different type of life. Verses 6 through 8, use the gifts that you've been given and you've been blessed with. Then verses 10 through 16, show kindness to all. Again, this is just a huge summation or overview. And then 17 through 21, overcome evil with good. It's talking about how we live our lives day in and day out. This is our service to God. And so when it says, this is your reasonable service, that's exactly right. And that's a proper translation because the context demands it without even going back and looking at how this or that is translated. The context would draw that conclusion. It's talking about how we live each and every day. It's very important for us to see. In John chapter 16 and verse 2, they shall put you out of the synagogue, yea, a time will come, and whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Now the same word that's translated over in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 is also used here and translated as service. That means that if they did that, in their minds, they're thinking they're serving God. Nobody would ever come to a text like this and say it should be worship. They they were thinking they were worshiping. No, we wouldn't think that. And no Jew would come to that conclusion either. That because they were doing this, somehow that they were actually performing worship acts before God. They wouldn't even believe that. They wouldn't come to that conclusion. That's why it's translated as service. They believe that they were servants of God by doing what they were doing. So much so that they thought that they were serving God by killing followers of Christ. Jewish leaders did not consider putting men to death a form of worship. Don't you think about that for a minute? No, they did not. And so they believed that they were serving God. And again, that shows the difference. They would certainly have differentiated this service from their worship. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 9, he says, 
here in the description of the centurion as he's describing to Jesus the service that he renders for those that are under his command. And he talks about this type of authority that he has and those that are under him, he explains how they obey that and that is how they serve him. Now, the centurion is not giving a description of how individuals worship him. He's giving a description. This military leader is giving a description of those that are under him, how they obey his commands and perform service to him. And as he does so, he says, I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And he says, I say to this man, go. You know what he does? He goes. I say to this man, come. You know what he does? He comes. I say to this man, do this. That's what he does. (laughs) You know, this is the description of that service. And so this is also the nature of our service unto the Lord. As the Lord speaks, what do we do? You know, in, in a way that we do it in the, in the United States, yes, sir. We, we say, yes, absolutely. We would say, yes, Lord. Yes, Master, we will do. You have spoken, that's what we're going to do. We're going to serve you. And so this faithful obedience, it's not worship, but it is our reasonable service to God that is up in heaven. And so fulfilling or obeying a command is not necessarily worship. And I want you to understand, just because we obey some command that we find in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, does not mean that that was worship just by doing this. However, we do obey commands to perform actions of worship because there is regulation there is information that tells us how to appropriately and properly worship god in spirit and in truth and because of that when that information is there in regards to our actual actions of worship then when we perform them we are obeying commands but they specifically deal with those actions of worship and this, again, is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, dealing with the Lord's Supper. He says, this do, that is a direct command. And so when we're fulfilling that, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, we did it this morning, we are fulfilling that direct imperative command to remember the Lord and His death. Not every command we may obey is worship. And as I stated earlier in James chapter 5 and verse 8, be also patient is an imperative. We would not say that just because I've practiced patience means that I have offered worship unto God. And so there is a difference. Every aspect of Christian's life is service to God, but not all of service is worship. I want to talk a moment about the difference between private individual worship and collective congregational worship. And as we study worship, it's important for us to understand these different things. There is such a thing as accepted private or individual worship. And there is such a thing as a collective or congregational worship. And when we look at the text, we're going to see that. So, um, uh, William Stewart, he said this, Let us be careful not to limit our worship to three or four hours of assembly time with the Lord's people per week. And what he has reference to is that yes, we must be worshiping together, but we also have opportunity to worship God and perform actions of worship outside of the collection of the saints. And what I mean by that, prayer is worship. Should I pray outside of this assembly? Well, yes. Is that an action of worship? Yes. And so when I do it, and as the Bible says, as I go into my closet to to pray, and when I do that, I am worshiping God. And so what he is saying is, we should not think that the only time that we should be worshiping God is just when we come together. We also have opportunities outside of that to have those actions of worship that are offered before Almighty God. We ought to habitually set time aside to worship the Lord privately, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 6. Recall Jesus made it a habit to worship the Lord individually in the mountains. He did this on several occasions. When He went aside, He went alone. He went away from everybody else, and He worshiped God in that avenue of prayer. And we also have that same opportunity. And what a blessing to be able to express our thanksgiving and adoration to the Lord through prayer and even in song. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 6, it says, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. When thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which is in secret shall reward thee openly. 
Uh, certainly, prayer is worship because anyone um, that understands what we would consider five acts of worship or has ever even heard that or said that knows that one of those five that's included in there is prayer. We wouldn't say, well, just because we've prayed collectively, that's an act of worship. But if we prayed individually, that wouldn't be an action of worship. It's an action of worship. Prayer is an action of worship. And anybody who says it is collectively would also have to agree it is individually. And so that is important for us to understand. This verse also shows that we are commanded to perform this action of worship individually, and we also know collectively as well. But here, we have it individually. In Matthew chapter 14 and verse 23, And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into the mountain apart to pray, and when the evening was come, he was there alone. And so we even have an example of our Savior doing this. When he had sent them away, he departed in the mountain to pray. In Mark's account and Luke's account, Luke 6 and verse 12, And it came to pass in those days that he went out into the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer unto God. And that is absolutely a pattern that we should follow as well. When we look at the example of Jesus, we look at his life, we also have the same type of opportunity to worship God through this avenue as an individual. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2 says, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Psalm 69 and verse 30 says, I will praise the name of the Lord with song and will magnify Him with thanksgiving. So, about worship. Individual and private worship is a necessary part of just the Christian life. If we are walking as we should and living the Christian life, then there are going to be times when we are individual, we are alone, and we offer up what would be considered an action of worship unto God. However, individual worship alone does not fulfill the command for collective worship. And I want, that to, I, want, I want you to sit on that for a minute. And I want you to think about it. We are, of course, commanded. I mean, we see several places where even individuals were singing and they were offering praise to God and they were individuals doing so. When individuals pray unto God, you are offering an action of worship unto God. And when you do those things, you ought to do it with a thus saith the Lord. We don't have a right just because we're individuals just all by ourselves, and we go into our closet to pray, to pray in a way that would not be in accordance with the will of God. When we offer that individually, that act of worship or that action of worship individually, it has to be according to the will of God. We can't go in there and not pray according to the will of God and think that it's going to be acceptable because we're individual. So when whether it is individually or whether it is collectively, when we offer up that worship, it is to be according to the will of God in spirit and in truth. So certainly there are commands, information in the Bible that teaches us that we individually may offer that action, those actions of worship as an individual. However, those individuals that, and there are some that say, well, you know what, I don't ever have to be a part of the ecclesia. I don't have to be a part of a congregation. I can choose to worship all by myself, and I can do that all the time, and never join myself with an assembly of the saints. And what I'm saying is, the Bible doesn't support that. Now, I'll show you why. And what I'm showing you is, yes, an individual may be, by themselves, offer up an acceptable action of worship. The Bible does teach that. However, doing that does not fulfill the command for the collective worship. And so a person may say, well, I'm doing this and I'm all by myself. That's true. And that worship that they may be offering, it, it may be acceptable, that portion of it, but they have not fulfilled the commandment that God has provided for a collective worship. And that's important. Let's see. When you evangelize in a remote village in Africa, which, which I have done, then it's, you, you are faced with dilemmas that you guys sitting here probably have never even, it's never even crossed your mind. It didn't mind when I was sitting in the same position before I had gone overseas and was trying to do something like that. So i got to go to a place where there's not a soul that's a Christian, not a one. So when I go into that village and I drive an hour and a half, two hours, three hours to go study with people in that village to try to get somebody to obey the gospel, when I have one person that obeys the gospel, i got to go back. 
because I have obligations with my home congregation. I have to go back to my family. I can't stay there and worship with them all those hours away. And so I have to leave, and those individuals now have to worship. There is no congregation. In some of the places that we would go, there's no congregation within three or four hours, very far. That's in my vehicle, driving fast. That is not in public transportation. It would take them all day. They couldn't make it to another worship service through public transportation, even if they tried. It's too far. So what do you do then? Well, you have one person. Can that one person then worship God in spirit and in truth? The answer is yes. Because there's, there's no other option. Now, does that mean that we're going to stop trying to evangelize? Or that person is going to... That we're going to stop teaching that person to tell them to try to save their family members or to teach the other people around them? No. We're going to keep working. And hopefully there's going to be two people that are going to be present to worship. And then three, and then four. And then you know what? Before long, you have a group that can worship together. But you know what? You've got to start somewhere. You know, J.C. Choke, he has a book that he puts out in a lot of different languages. He wrote that a long time ago, though he's passed. It's still very effective material. And it's how to start the true church in your area. And they send that all over the place. It's gone to places in India where there's not a soul that's a Christian. And when a person studies through that and they're studying through their Bible and they're going back and forth and then they learn about what to do and how to worship God and, they, and then they obey the Gospel. They've contacted somebody and they, they, they've obeyed the Gospel now. They have to do that. They have to start worshiping there. The congregation, the church is now planted in that area and they have to start worshiping. So it is acceptable. Now what happens is some people say, well, I thought there has to be two or three gathered together in my name to be uh, accepted. There had to be two or three. You heard that, right? You heard people say, well, there are two or three gathered together in my name. That's a misapplication of the verse. The verse doesn't deal with that. As a matter of fact, if you look at the verse, it doesn't, it's not dealing with worship. It's not dealing with gathering together for that purpose. It's actually dealing with gathering together as witnesses. And if you go back to the Old Testament, in order to have a claim against a witness, there were two or three witnesses. Read Hebrews chapter 10. You know verse 25, not forsaking. Go on down in the context and you'll read where he talks about having two or three witnesses according to Moses' law and how much sore of a punishment it's going to be for those that tread, under, tread the cross of Christ under their feet. And so we understand what that meant from the Old Testament. And he says, again, in the context, you have to deal with congregational problems. You deal with it one-on-one. -on -one. If a brother is sinned against another, you go to them. If it's not dealt with, then you gather additional indiv individuals. You go to them again and try to work it out. If they refuse to repent, it goes before the whole congregation, the church. The church attempts to try to do it, to try to encourage that person to come back and to come to repentance. If they refuse, then there is discipline. And he says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm there. He says, when you go through this process, I am with you. This is my authority. This is what I've asked you to do in church discipline. And when you practice this, I am with you. You are not alone. Anybody who's ever been one of the witnesses to go to somebody knows that's no fun. And it's great encouragement to know I am not alone when I go through this process. That's what that verse is dealing with. It's not talking about people gathering together for worship. So people get in their mind, well, you've got to have two or three to have acceptable worship. Where That verse has nothing to do with our assembly. It doesn't. So when we understand that, then we may say, well, wait a minute, maybe I've had a little bit of a misunderstanding of worship and what it means. Let's talk about collective worship. You've heard ecclesia many times. Ecclesia. We're the ecclesia, right? It's the transliteration of the Greek word that is there, uh, representative of church. It's translated as church. But I want to show you something. We may acceptably worship God privately, yet God desires and commands for His saints to worship Him collectively. And that's important for us to understand. Ecclesia in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, there is a term that is there. Now, again, this word that is highlighted is the transliteration of the Hebrew. And that word, when it is translated, that is, if you take the Hebrew Old Testament, and then they translated it into Greek, because in the first century, that's what they had. They had, for those Greek speakers, the Septuagint. They had the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, and many would be using this, those Greek speakers in that time. 
And so when you go there and you look at this word and you see how it has been translated, then you're going to notice that the word ecclesia is used in the passages. That's, in, that's, again, translating the Old Testament into Greek. The word is used there in the Old Testament. And what does it say in English when it's brought into our Old Testament? I mean, our Old Testament in English. What does it say? It's assembly. So if you have a, the ecclesia from the Old Testament, it is translated as assembly in Deuteronomy 5.22. In Genesis 48, 4, multitude. In Genesis 35, 11, and there's many more. It's company. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of how this word was used and what exactly it did mean. Again, here's a couple of additional references to the verb form. It means to gather as an assembly or congregation. Now, we use the word congregation all the time. But what does it mean to congregate? I mean, well, we know that. To congregate, it means for a group to come together, right? I mean, what does it mean to assemble? I mean, if you've got a whole bunch of parts, you go uh, to Walmart, and you buy a bicycle, and it comes in a box, and it says you've got to assemble this thing. You know what? We've got a whole bunch of different parts, and we've got to put it all together as one. We know what the word means in our normal usage, but when it comes to religious uh, usage, sometimes we get confused. So assembly means to come together. Congregate means to come together. And that's exactly what this word is. And so in Exodus 32.1, they gathered themselves together. Leviticus 8.4 was gathered together. Joshua 18.1, assembled together. 1 Kings 8.1, assembled. So this gives you an idea how, how ecclesia was used from the Old Testament in the Greek Septuagint. And here is the proof. So this is a lot of information. I realize that. But it's one thing for a preacher to stand up from you and say that it's there. It's another one to show it. So I'm going to show it. Again, here's Matthew 16, 18. We all know. Jesus said, I will build my church, right? And that's the word ecclesia. I've got it referenced here from the majority text. And then also you can see that it is referenced down below as well. I've got two different ones that are referenced that shows you. Now, if you look at the Septuagint, that is the Greek translation of the Old Testament of Judges 21 and verse 8, you don't, have to be a Greek, you don't have to be a Greek scholar to see that those two words are the same. Because you can see it in yellow. That's the same. Now, in our English translation of Judges 21 and verse 8, the words that we get there is, is translated into English, the assembly. And so, that is exactly what we see there. It is the same word that has been used in the Greek for Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18 is also in the Hebrew translation that is there, the Greek translation of the Hebrew in Judges 21 and verse 8. Here is another reference as well from Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 2 in which the word that we get, ecclesia or church, is translated as congregation in Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 2. So are we commanded to come together into one place or assemble for worship? I mean, that's the question that we're asking as we look. We know that there can be private worship, but just me by myself, with no intention to join myself to a congregation, with no intention to put myself under the authority of an eldership, just me saying, I'm not going to do that, that's not going to work. That's not going to fulfill the command to be an assembly to congregate for worship. It won't do it. And so when you look at the word that is referenced here in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, when it talks about the assembling of ourselves together, the word is used identically in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. It's not talking about the assembly of the saints for worship in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1, but it is talking about a gathering together. And that is how that word is translated there. It is the same from the original language in the Greek, and it is episunage, or synagogue. You, you can see where we get the word synagogue that would derive from that and that would come together, which would reference the same thing. And uh, Thayer's Greek lexicon says that this is a gathering together in one place. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, it has reference to an actual gathering together into one place. Now, this ver the verb form of this word, episunago, is used eight times in our New Testament. Eight times 
in reference to assembly. I want to show you those verses. What are we talking about? We are talking about the same root that is used in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25 of which we are very familiar with. And I want to see how that word is used, the verb form of it. In Matthew 23 and verse 37, it talks about being gathered together. It's used twice because you have a, a gathering together again. Now let's read the verse. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not gather them together. Matthew 24, 31, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of the trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect at the four winds. And from one end of the heaven unto the other, there is a gathering together. That is the word that is used. Mark 1, 33, again, you have the gathering together, referencing the same uh, passage that is above. In Mark 13, 27, he says, And when they... He shall send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, the uttermost part of the earth, and to the uttermost part of heaven. Uh, Mark chapter 13 and verse 27. Luke 12, 1. And in the meantime, when they were gathered together in an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod upon one another, him or he began to say unto his disciples, First of all, beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Luke chapter 12 and verse 1. So when they were gathered together, Luke 13 and verse 34, referencing as we've said before, that is the passage in Matthew 23 and 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets, stonest them which send unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, as a hen doth her, gathereth her brood under her wings, and ye would not. And the last is Luke 17, 37. What do you notice from this? There is clearly... Uh, what's reference to a gathering together. This is how the words are used in other places. The same as we would get assembly in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the question is, because we've answered, we can individually worship God, but is that going to do the rest of our life? That's my question. Can I, all by myself, worship God and then refuse to join myself to an assembly? And is that going to be acceptable unto God? Because you may have people in the remotest of Mongolia. And if you go to Mongolia and you hike up into the mountains for miles and miles, you're going to come across people that are nobody anywhere even close. What if they obey the gospel? They can worship there. I mean, there's nobody else around. That's where they are. That's where they live. They can worship God. But I'm talking about the individual who has the ability to assemble where God has commanded them to. Is that individual going to have the right to say, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to assemble with others. I'm going to stay right here. And that is the question. Does the Bible say anything about assembling together? And Well, the answer is yeah. Hebrews 10, 25 does talk about that. We've seen how so many times the same root word is used, the verb form of that, which means a gathering together. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it is dealing with worship. I mean, how often have you heard when someone's standing up and dealing with the Lord's Supper, they reference 1 Corinthians chapter 11, this text, and talking about taking of the items of the Lord's Supper, they do. And so in verse 17, he says, Now, in this I declare unto you, that I praise you not, that you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. Notice verse 18. For first of all, when you come together in the church, that's the ecclesia. So now he has two words. We already have seen that ecclesia, even in the Old Testament, has reference to an, a coming together, an assembly. And now he's used both of them because he says when you come together in the church. That's very specific. I hear there's divisions. I partly believe it. Verse 20. He says, When you come together, therefore into one place. So there is certainly information and guidance when he's talking about, what is this? What is he talking about? In chapter 11, well, we know they were gathering together. Why? They were taking the Lord's Supper. They were worshiping God. And they were there for that assembly. And there's some problems he's having to deal with in what? The assembly. So what is he talking about when they are all gathering together into one place? So is there such a thing? Yes. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we see it again. 
When he gives instruction about their assemblies, as we would call it, when they are gathered together, he provides instruction so that they do things decently in order, right? That's the last of the, the chapter in chapter 14, so that their, their worship is not chaos, so that when they assemble together, it's not chaotic, so that there is benefit. And he explains that in the whole of chapter 14. He says, if therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and then he begins to deal with some of the issues that they were having, whether it be tongues or prophecy, and he does that as throughout the text. In verse 26, he says, how is it then, brethren, when you come together, everybody has a psalm, a doctrine, a tongue, a revelation, interpretation, it's confusion. And so he provides an order and a structure to their worship, and they were coming together into one place. So are we committed to come together into one place or assemble for worship? The answer well, you've seen the context. You've seen the verses. What does the Bible say? We've seen that there's such a thing as private worship. Yes. And when I do that, I have to do it according to the will of God. I can't pray however I want to pray when I'm by myself. And only the rules apply for how I pray when I'm collectively worshiping with other people. It goes the same when I'm singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Colossians 3.16, Ephesians 5.19. I can't do whatever I want when I'm a, in, in, as an individual and then just say, well, that only applies when I'm singing those songs, hymns, and spiritual songs unto God when I'm collectively. It would go across the board. We have to follow those instructions in our private worship and in our collective worship. It's important to notice that God wants His saints to come together. There's a reason for it. And this is not a, a bad thing. This is a blessing. Because when you really study this, you're going to find that the collective assembly is a blessing that God has given us. Did you miss it when you were out, when the, everything was going crazy and with all of this sickness? I know I did. I miss being around everybody. We're still not out of the woods yet, and it's so hard, it's so frustrating, it's difficult. But couldn't you, you, you feel like there's, there's something missing? I mean, a big piece of your, a big chunk of your life, your encouragement and being around each other and helping each other, it's, it wasn't there. The blessing of an assembly God has provided for us is just amazing. When you look at the negative aspect, Westcott says this he says, Christians are not to abandon the opportunities of meeting. On the positive side, they are to use the power of mutual influence. So there's a negative side, and then there is a great positive side to actually coming together and worshiping together. Can you imagine how hard it really would be if you, all by yourself, lived in the far reaches of Mongolia, and you were the only one? The only Christian. You know how hard that would that would be tough. That would be how difficult that would be to not have that encouragement, that mutual edification. How challenging that would be. Kaufman says the greatest diligence should be exercised in the cultivation of this community fellowship, mutual love among brethren, the mutual participation in common joys and sorrows of the entire membership, and the mutual encouragement in every good work are basic principles of the kingdom of heaven. And he points to Pliny. He points to a reference to the Romans when they were writing about the activities of the early Christians and what they were doing. And, and as early as 112 A.D., you have Romans that are spying on Christians, trying to figure out if they're trying to be a mutiny against the king, or against Caesar, excuse me, in the Roman Empire, and he reports what he saw. He says, on an appointed day, they had been accustomed to meet before daybreak. Kaufman says the tenacity maintained by the Christians in regard to their assemblies is evident. They attended regular worship services in spite of every hindrance. Christians met in the darkness of pre-dawn assemblies. Referencing what Pliny had written all those years ago, they were so dedicated. They wanted to be together. They knew they had to be together to encourage each other. Kaufman says this mere church attendance is without value if it is empty. Again, going back to our worship, he said, God desires wholehearted, sincere, devout, and faithful public worship of Almighty God through Christ. A.T. Robertson says this, uh, Winford Claiborne quoted him, he said, already some Christians have formed the habit of not attending public worship, a perilous habit then and now. Speaking of Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, why are we here there's, a, there's several reasons. We're here to worship God. 
But in the process of doing that, the Bible also teaches us that we are exhorting each other. And it tells us that that exhorting is to take place with a collection of Christians. That they, they assemble themselves, they congregate, and in the process of doing that, they exhort each other. They provoke unto love and good works. And so what does exhort mean? It means to urge, to warn, to encourage. Literally meaning to call to one side for comfort and support by definition. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, Kaufman says, this is a vital to spiritual growth and attainment. Through this epistle, the necessity for constant encouragement and exhortation of the believing community is emphasized. Mutual exhortation helps us fight evil. And isn't that true? You know, the Bible says in context of talking about what is considered an assembly, a coming together, a congregational. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24, he talks about provoking. What does that mean? It's taken from two different words put together. One means beside. The other means to sharpen, to stimulate, to incite. So we come beside each other to do that. It means that you call somebody by your side to try to help them, to encourage them, to provoke them. Christians must incite and inspire one another to love and good works according to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. One another, religion, is what Christianity is. And when you read through all of the passages describing what it means to live in Christ, you'll see it is a one another religion. And so we are to consider one another, we are to provoke one another into love and good works, and we are to exhort one another. But where does the Bible describe this activity taking place? It certainly can take place outside of it, but it specifically describes it being in a collection of saints, an assembly, a congregation that has come together. Christians also consider one another, as the structure of the Greek sentence makes clear, by not neglecting to meet together. This is from Neil Lightfoot. He says, we are urged to meet together for mutual edification. There is a vital connection between the expressions meet together and encouraging one another. Let me say that again because I think that's important. There's a vital connection between the expressions meet together and encouraging one another. And I think, I think that we understand that maybe more than we have in the past because of what we've gone through. I think we understand that all the more. Neil Eifert says they were to meet together where such encouragement was available in the assembly. A chief function of public worship, according to Paul, is the edification of all who come together. But how can men be edified when they absent themselves from that assembly? Also, he says, when it says forsaking, he says this participle, neglecting, ordinarily the verb means to leave behind, to leave in the lurch, I misspelled that, and to abandon. He also says, according to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 and following, but because the author writes, let us consider one another and encouraging one another, there can be little doubt that he saw the neglect of the assembly would in time lead to an utter desertion of the faith. And I think the body as a whole, and actually I think religion, uh, religious groups in a whole are going to see that. I think um, all over the world we're going to see that because when people decide that they're going to neglect that assembly, and a lot of them will just they'll turn away. During a time when they haven't been, the, been with the group that is there to encourage them and help them, and over a period of time, you know what? It just gets easier, and it gets easier, and it gets easier, and then I think that we will see, I hope not, but I think we will, that there will be a lot of people that will just never, never come back. You know what they're going to do? They're going to abandon that assembly. And what he's saying is that's exactly what happens that they, over time, it just doesn't affect them anymore. Their, their conscience becomes seared to what they really need. And, and then before long, they just abandon and turn away from the assembling of worshiping our God together. Are we commanded to come together in one place or assemble for worship? I want you to take one more thought and then the lesson will be yours. There are people that say, well, I can do this all by myself. By myself. I, I, you know, we've already identified there is such a thing as private worship, right? Yes. Okay. 
And there are people that will say, well, I'm going to do that, and that's fine. I'm going to worship right here on my couch forever. And we're not talking about those that are sick, those that are shut in, those that can't get... We're not talking about that. We're talking about in general. There are some people that are just going to stay there and never decide to assemble with the saints for worship. They have made that determination that they will never do that. And they feel like they're okay. But that can't be possible. And I'm going to tell you why. Because you can't have elders without that collective assembly. And those people that are saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to worship right here by myself, and this is what I'm going to do, and I am refusing to assemble with the saints, then we can safely say that's not right. Because when you look at it, you can't have one elder alone. We know that. Over and over and over, the pattern is that there's elders. And so you can't just have one. And so an elder, a shepherd, has to have sheep to shepherd. Also, an overseer has to have those to oversee. Therefore, there must be a congregation of saints for there to be an eldership. And a scripturally organized congregation requires elders... And in order for him to be an elder, what does he have to have? He's got to be the husband of one wife. Oh, and well now you got two people. You know, then there's children. Well, you've got another. And so at least if you're saying that, well, to be an elder, you can have one child. So you've got a, an elder, you've got his wife, you've got a child. You've got an elder, his wife, and a child. So now you've got to have two elders. You've got to have at least six. So you can't stay and say, well, I'm going to be this by myself, and this is going to be okay. God must accept it. No. That's just not what we see in the Scriptures. When we really start digging down, we really start studying about this worship and start thinking about it, then we're going to see that couldn't be possible. It's not going to be possible. So there is a collection. There is a congregational collective worship that God wants us to be a part of. And so if you're an individual and you're saying, I'm going to stay here and I'm not going to join myself to a congregation to worship God, that's wrong. Because God desires you to do so. Matter of fact, He wants you to have shepherds that are over you. He desires that for you. That's what an, an organized congregation is. One that has that organization. That's what He desires from you. And so we should be willing then to join ourselves together so that we have a group of Christians whereby we can have appointed shepherds to oversee that flock. By saying, well, I'm just going to do this by myself, we are standing in rebellion against God. And so that's something that we have to consider when we study about worship, what it means. We cannot say all of life is worship. It's not. Our service to God. We do it all through life, day in and day out. We should be serving God, but our worship is different than that. It is intentional, it is specific, and there are specific actions that we perform that is worship unto God. Pumping gas in the gas tank, talking to the person across the way is not one of them. You won't find it in the Bible. We also see that there is some private worship we should be involved in. We should be praying individually. But we also are commanded to come together, to collect ourselves together to worship God, and that's exactly what we ought to do as well. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, you have an opportunity to do so, to obey the gospel. We hope that you will believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior of the world, that believing that, you'll turn away from all your past sins, repent of those past sins, confess with your lips, yes, He is the Savior, and be baptized so that your past sins can be washed away, so that you can rise to walk as a new creature in Jesus Christ. Why not today give your life to Christ and serve Him all the rest of your days? Maybe you've not been faithful and you need to be restored. You can do so. We have an invitation song that's prepared. Won't you come?